So we, last Sunday morning, we talked about the prophets in the last portion of this chapter, or the last portion before we get into the text this morning, was looking at this great concept of how that the prophets had brought this message down to us, and yet they, they didn't know everything. They only knew the portion which they had. They sought to seek it out. But they also understood that they were not going to be um, enjoying the benefit of it. When we look at the hope and the new birth, as Peter is revealing it in his message, and the greatness of what we have as Christians today, it should still bring a lot of excitement to us about our salvation. That prior to Christ, it was a completely different spiritual world and relationship with God. People had to go through sacrifices that were inadequate. They were sacrificing animals that had no reason to have to suffer, but they did because of us. But that blood that, that was being shed was inadequate. It was never going to be able to uh, replace the penalty, the payment for the penalty. Yet when Christ came and the message had been planned and told all the way from the beginning, starting with Eve, when God told Eve that through her descendants that one would come and that this this one that would come would be victorious. And we see this promise coming through Abraham and all the way down. And then the prophets as the kingdom of Israel was established and God trying to reflect to the nations this, this massive, beautiful uh, vision that he had of the final kingdom through Daniel when he talked about the statue. And we know that even Daniel sought out to understand what he was seeing and hearing and that the message that he had the last vision, he was told to seal that up because it was something that wasn't going to happen right away. It was going to be years down the road before it finally came to be. And so that was about four or five hundred years, if you, if you look, depending on it. And that they understood that the 70-week prophecy that we hear about in Daniel was something that, they, that the Jews and the scholars of the, the Jewish nation could look at and they could actually lay it out year-wise. And they understood that it was coming within the window that they were living at at the time when Christ came. So there were so many things, the, the, the Psalms, the prophets, the law itself. Moses even said there would come one that was greater than him, and you need to listen to him. And so once he came, this, this revealing of everything was now in the open, and that you and I are now a part of this magnificent uh, plan that has been fulfilled and I just feel that, you know, and I, I'm including myself, that it's easy for us to take for granted and to forget about the greatness of this magnificent plan of salvation that we have. And in the end there of, chap, of verse 12 there, he says, And the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, which we know in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit descended down upon the apostles, and he said that things which angels even yearn to look in, that's how secretive it was that even angels were wanting to look into these these uh, these prophecies being fulfilled and understand what God's magnificent plan was. So let's go ahead and read um, the text that we're going to have, and then we're going to come back. So let's start in verse. Well, I guess just mine froze. Okay. I guess just mine's froze down here. Because I was looking at the Zoom and I'm like, uh oh. So, in looking at our. He says, therefore, why? It's a link back to what he had just talked about when it comes to looking at the prophets and the great uh, rebirth and who we are. In the planet we have, he says, then with that in mind, he says, prepare your minds for action, being sober minded, um, being, in other words, clear thinking about what's going on around you, because this is something that's important. And in, in, I thought of Luke 12, um, 35, when he talks about the vineyard or the being ready and having their lamps trimmed and the oil and all the, the ideas around 
making sure that we are prepared for action, you know, staying dressed for action and keeping your lamps burning. There's so many uh, times where Jesus is, teaches himself about being prepared, being ready, not being caught off guard. I just imagine for a moment how many times that, that God, through the history of man, had watched him become unprepared and being caught off guard. Yes, you know, when we talk about if there's a warning about being prepared, that means there's a consequence for not being prepared. And that's something that we see in the parables um, about the, the maids with the wine, the, the, sorry, the oil and not being prepared, that they're going to be shut out. They're going to be lost. In Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6, Paul says, So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. The idea of a, you know, this not conscious awareness, you know, when we're asleep. And he says there are some that that's the way they are living. They're living as if they're asleep, as if, you know, there's nothing going on around them. So it is something very important about this idea. And then he says, for ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray to slaves to various passions in Titus 3.3. Passing our days in, in malice, envy, and hatred by others. Um, so the next part, when he says this idea of being holy, I think is... Um, is hard because when we think about the idea of us being holy and saying you also be holy God saying when we we know this quote you know you shall be holy for I am holy sometimes again because of the way that the words are used or I, I maybe it's just our own insecurities have a hard time you know with uh, comprehending this idea of, of being holy and that somehow that we can achieve a level of holiness. So let's look at the word itself when we look at um, what holy means. When we look in the English dictionary, it, it's something that's dedicated or consecrated to God or a religious pers- purpose or sacred. So when, when he says you are to be holy, then you are to be dedicated. You are to be consecrated for God. It's not something unattainable. It's something very achievable. A lot of times, you know, we think of holy, sacred, um, righteous. These terms, we're uncomfortable with believing somehow that we can accomplish these and be them. There's, you may say, well, I know people that have. No, it's, it's not unachievable for all Christians to be righteous, to be perfected through the blood of Christ. It's, it's the perfection of having a relationship and that process of when we sin, we repent and we come back and we, re- we ask for forgiveness, we receive that forgiveness and that whole process and that dedication that we have towards him is what brings us into a perfect relationship to where when he sees us he doesn't see all the times that we keep coming back accessing you know the blood for forgiveness and continually doing that and keeping a list against us he sees us as being presented perfect and righteous and blameless and so we are dedicated we are to be holy and to be consecrated now and and even in the greek word that is used in this text, it's, it's the same as the way we use it in English, um, is to make or declare sacred, separate, dedicated. So we, he says, are to be dedicated and separate for a specific purpose. And that's what God is. He says, I am holy, I am dedicated, I'm righteous, He's blameless. And again, I'm already starting to see some go, whoa, 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 wait a minute. See, I'm not that. Well, I just explained that. 
Yes, you can be, and you should be, and you should understand this, because that was unattainable. Before, under the old law, all it could do is just kind of roll all that interest forward, but never pay the principal. But now the blood of Christ has brought us into that relationship. So it's for a divine purpose. It's, it's for the purpose of God. And so what's that purpose that we're to have when we think about as Christians? And so we, cause we really need to tie down. If you don't know what your job is, then you can't really do it. And I think that's the part that he starts to as, as well develop. But when we, when we think about it, we as Christians are to be like God. So how is God? Well, we can look at his character of who he is. We can see that he's merciful. We can see that he is caring about others, even though they don't deserve his care. He is forgiving about others. Um, he is merciful. All those characteristic traits. And the greatest one that is constantly described of himself, he is love. The agape, care for others, give, want them the best over all things. And so this is something that's, that's um, something that we can do. Um, and that's what in Titus he describes as saying that we were, we were once, we were once that, we were foolish, we were disobedient, let us slay, let, let away easily to the passions, desires of what we want to make ourselves feel good, to satisfy ourselves. And, and that though, he said, and we spent a lot of that time in, in malice, when he describes that as malady, something bad, you know, something for not correct uh, motivations and stuff. Envy, hatred, hatred by others. These are the opposite of characteristic traits of God. Um, I was going the wrong. Got my finger going the wrong direction on the slides here. This is where Peter is quoting this from in Leviticus 44. He says, For I am the Lord your God, consecrate. There it is. Set yourself apart. This is the same concept he's always had for those who he calls his own. Is that we have this separation from the rest of the world. The whole purpose of the nation of Israel was to reflect a nation that was following God and the benefits and such that they were enjoying because of it. In Hebrews 12, 14, supporting the idea again about not being hateful and stuff, but he says, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one else no one will see the Lord. So without being separate from the world and dedicated for God, being holy, he says, you can't see God. In 2 Corinthians 7, 11, he says, since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of the body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. So by removing and, and separating ourselves from the world and our, our passions and desires and making ourselves into the image of Christ is what then brings us holy, sacred, set apart in service for God. And then he says, with, in here in Corinthians, he says, fear of God, which is reverence. Uh, trembling, you know, something that we think of God and we have so much care and love for him that, that we want to please him and we want to serve him. Now here is a great link with the idea of salvation and, and judgment here again. Um, judgment is, is always with us. There's always a level of degree that we need to realize as well. And so he says if we are holy and... You know, if we're holy and we call on him who is father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds. So if we are holy, we call on the father, we understand that he also is a judge and he's impartial. 
He's not going to show favoritism. So you're not going to be able to say, well, I'm better than so-and-so or I've accomplished certain things. No, it's not. It, it's impartial according to what we do. What we do. And then knowing that you were ransomed from your futile ways inherited from your forefathers. This is where there are several things in this text where it appears that Peter is bringing out a lot of his Jewish upbringing and his Jewish knowledge when he talks about, especially here, like being the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. These were things that could be very Jewish because of the things in which that they were inheriting under Mosaic law was, was kind of feudal because it wasn't going to accomplish what they really wanted. And all of the Jews that were spiritual wanted salvation. They wanted to be right with God. They wanted to receive the reward. And he says, but yet you were ransomed. So what does it mean, ransom? Well, when somebody's kidnapped and taken, what do they usually demand? They demand a ransom. You have to pay so much in order to get them back. And so we were, in a sense, enslaved to, if it's your passions that the forefathers brought to you and the the moral behaviors that you had inherited from your your family and all of that, like the Gentiles and pagans had, or whether you were uh, a Jew that was following the Mosaic law, really all of that was futile when it comes to the final plan of salvation. But you were ransomed. And you weren't ransomed with just anything. You were ransomed with something very precious. So you couldn't, there's no way that you could pay this ransom. It's tied back again to the idea of everything that he lists there when he says, you know, such perishable things as silver and gold. Well, that's about the best you could get. So you, no matter how much you had, you're not going to be able to bring that and, and have that redemption. So what were you ransomed by? He says, the precious blood of Christ. And this is where, again, some of his Hebrewisms or his, his, his identification of the, the way that God has provided the lamb, of Christ being like the lamb. He says, like the lamb without blemish or spot. That's the shadow. That was the shadow of Christ, the lamb's blood was something that they were sacrificing under the Mosaic law, but it was just a shadow. It wasn't a real thing. It couldn't do that. It could not ransom them. And so the blood of that lamb had to be the lamb that was Christ, uh, figuratively speaking. So how long has this plan been in process? From the foundations of the world. And look what he says. He says that the foundation of the world was made manifest in these last times for your sake as Christians, you and I. That's, that's when we, we have finally been a part of that. And how? Because believers in God. And here's again the idea and concept of resurrection to where if people don't believe in the resurrection, then everything that Christianity is based upon is a waste. It, it's a waste. And you know we can go to 1 Corinthians 15, we can go to the Thessalonians. We can look at being taught very boldly about resurrection and the importance of it. But it is throughout all the concepts of the gospel about the importance of the resurrection to the plan of salvation. And so and this is another verse, another thought here that Peter brings out in First Peter is that through him were made believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in him. And this is in Romans 16, in Paul's closing of the Roman letter, he says, And now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but now has been disclosed through the prophetic writings that has been known, made known to all nations. Now that's all peoples. In when he's talking about that, according to the command of the eternal God to bring about obedience of faith. So, and this word is the good news that was preached to you. So what was it? 
So what's the good news when we think about the gospel? Well, here he points out that we've been born again and that nothing that's perishable but through the living word of God, through the gospel message is what has been brought to us. Okay, so now let's um, have some discussion real quick before we wrap up class this morning. So uh, Peter says, preparing in verse 13, preparing your minds for blank and being blank. What are, we, what are we to prepare our minds for, he says in 13. Good hope. He says minds for action. Action. Work. Not preparing your minds to to just believe, but he says we prepare our minds for action and being clear thinking, sober minded. So in uh, 15, but he who has called you is blank and you also be blank in all your conduct. Holy. Holy. So in what is holy again? Holy is set apart, dedicated, consecrated. Set apart, consecrated. And can we achieve this as Christians? According to the scripture, we can. Yes. Absolutely. We must. Absolutely. You know, the, the, the flesh will never be perfected. It's not. We're always going to sin. That's what John says in his first letter. He says, he who is without sin. You know, and thinks they're without sin, they're lying to themselves. That we have sin and we're going to have to deal with it. And the process that we deal with it is by repentance and turning to him and asking for forgiveness. That is what we do as a Christian. And that whole process is continual. It's, a, it's in place. When you stop repenting and you stop asking for forgiveness, then it's broke. You are no longer presentable to him as perfect. You've lost access to that. So, knowing that you were ransomed from what? In 18. What were we ransomed from? He says, the futile ways inherited from your forefathers. And this could include the Jews. It could include the pagans. Because the ways in which they were striving towards to worship a superior God, gods, and the methods that they had were imperfect. They were futile. They were not going to accomplish what was necessary for them to receive eternal life. And so... My says conduct. Conduct. Mm-hmm. Knowing that you were ransomed from conduct. So what was a good... Go ahead, Becky. The gospel. What was the good news preached to them? Was the gospel. It was the gospel. And that gospel was out. was the, built around the idea of the resurrection and that we have this hope in it through the living word, his his word. So any comments, closing thoughts about this idea of holiness and, and the message that Peter has? Believe. 
The one thing when we talk about repentance, you can ask for repentance, but there's an action on your part that you must do also, and that is to mm -hmm. stop doing what you're asking for repentance for. Repent is to turn away from doing those actions. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what he says, is preparing our minds for action after considering the greatness of what we have been given to us, all those who serve to bring that message and that plan to accomplish bringing God's Son to us, um, and our belief in that together is something that's foundational and um, important, yeah. Any other comments, thoughts? Well, it's about 10 after the hour. That gives us about 35 minutes for those who are going to be coming down here. Um, so there, there are some updates on the announcements. When we start to uh, live stream, once we get set up for the worship, we'll take a look at those uh, announcements. Like I said, if you have any changes, updates, or anything, let us know so we can put those in there. If you're visiting with us uh, on live stream through Facebook or through uh, YouTube, I hope that you would subscribe and go ahead and come back, study with us. If you have questions, concerns, comments, or anything at all, um, that's what we're here for. We're here to learn. I don't have, you know, a lock on all knowledge here, and I'm not trying to teach every aspect of it. So I, you know, there's a lot about coming together and the knowledge that we all share is where we grow even greater in the image of Christ. So uh, we're going to go ahead and shut down for this moment, and then we'll get started and get set up for the worship. And I hope you have a, a beautiful morning. Thank you. Cool.